Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar Introducing Expert Testimony in Domestic Violence Cases. My name is Emily Thrush, and I'm the Project Coordinator at Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource on Violence Against Women, and I will be moderating today's webinar. This webinar will describe common victim behaviors and dy dynamics in intimate partner violence cases, as well as their impact on fact finders' assessments of victim credibility. The presenter will discuss the law related to the introduction of expert testimony by the prosecution to explain victim behavior and how to identify experts qualified to testify on this issue. This presentation will also highlight the importance of deciding whether to introduce expert testimony in a case. In addition, it will identify ways to work with experts to prepare a case for trial, even if the testimony will not be introduced. Before we begin the substantive portion of our program, I'll provide a brief overview of our iLink webinar service. You can listen to this webinar either via computer or conference call. For best use of iLink, I strongly recommend calling in from a landline to the conference line that's listed on the top left part of your screen, 530-881-1212 with the passcode 202-731-738-POUND. Again, the number is in the upper left-hand portion of your screen. If you are using a mobile phone, please do not use the speaker option. Listen with an earpiece if necessary. All call-in participants will be automatically muted throughout the webinar, and today's webinar is being recorded for later viewing. To connect to internet audio, please click the connect button on your start screen. If you use this audio option, please do not also call to the webinar. Only do so if you experience difficulty with your internet audio. If you have technical issues, you can use the iLink hand raise indicator, which is located on the toolbar in the top left-hand portion of your screen above the presenter's photo and to the right of the conference call number. Or you can contact iLink directly at 800-799-4510. We encourage you to post comments or questions via the private chat throughout today's presentation. There will also be questions for you to respond to throughout the presentation, and you can access the private chat window to the bottom left-hand portion of your screen. I will share questions anonymously so they can be addressed throughout the webinar. And for participants from Oklahoma, please send the responses to your feedback questions directly to me. My email address is on the screen, and it will also be available at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar is hosted by Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource on Violence Against Women, through funding from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office on Violence Against Women. Written materials, including a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and the presenter's biography, will be emailed to you after the presentation. In addition, today's webinar is being recorded for later viewing. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. Equitas provides prosecutors with the support, training, mentorship, and resources necessary to objectively evaluate and constantly re-examine and refine their approach to justice. Equitas staff conduct legal research, provide 24-7 case consultation, host specialized or state-specific training events and webinars, provide individual experts and jurisdictions to jurisdictions and organizations, and we publish articles, monographs, and other resources on topics relevant to the prosecution of violence against women. Today's presenter is John Wilkinson, Attorney Advisor at Equitas. John has presented extensively on the investigation and prosecution of domestic violence, sexual violence, stalking, and human trafficking, both in the United States and abroad. Prior to working with Equitas, John was the program manager for the Gun Violence Prosecution Program, Homeland Security Program, and Southwest Border Crime Program of the National District Attorney Association. From 1998 through 2005, John served as a national, excuse me, John served as an assistant Commonwealth attorney in Fredericksburg, Virginia, prosecuting cases involving intimate partner violence and sexual assault, including cases of campus sexual assault and domestic violence homicide. He also served on the Fredericksburg area sexual assault response team and prosecuted child sexual and physical abuse and neglect cases and infant homicides. John's full biography will be emailed following the webinar along with a PDF of today's PowerPoint presentation. And I would now like to turn the floor over to John for the substantive portion of today's presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for attending. Uh, 
Hold on a second. We're trying to work out the audio. Sorry, folks, bear with us, but we'll be right with you. Okay, can you all hear me now? Can you hear me? All right, well, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. <laughs> so anyway, uh, go ahead and private chat any uh, behaviors that you've seen in your domestic violence cases or things that you've seen that you think could be helped through uh, expert testimony, uh, explaining these things to the judge or jury that could be important. Um, these are often how these cases come down. This is often what the focus of the defense is going to be. Can this victim be believed based on the behaviors that they engaged in? Um, so did, uh, did we get uh, any responses? Recantation, refusal to testify, uh, the victim does not want to cooperate. Uh, or participate in the uh, investigation or prosecution. Uh, things like that are often what we find in these cases. And uh, those are things that we need to address at trial. If our judge or jury has an expectation in a case, in a domestic violence case, that there's going to be uh, violence, that there's going to be injury, that there's going to be a victim who is testifying, who is telling us what happened to them, who is participating in the investigation and prosecution, if those are their expectations, we've got to meet them. And if we don't have that victim, then we've got to explain why we don't. And that's what this is really about. So do these things impact uh, the judge or jury's decision? Does that behavior impact the judge or jury's decision? Of course it does. It's going to be the key to the case. It's going to be everything the case is really about. When we think about the things that you guys mentioned, recantation, how does a fact finder judge that, a judge or a jury? If the victim is really the victim, if this really happened, why are they saying it did? That's a tough thing for them to understand, and we have to explain it. Does the victim's behavior impact law enforcement, uh, prosecutors, other allied professionals that are responding, whether it's medical or some other responder? Of course it does. If we don't understand how these victims behave and why they do the things that they do in these cases, then we'll never get to the judge or jury because we won't make the right arrest or charging decisions in these cases. We won't understand what's going on. They're frustrating cases. This behavior happens quite a bit, and we have to understand it as practitioners so that we can explain it to the fact finders in these cases. So it's really important that we understand these behaviors are going to happen. It, everybody should be familiar with the power and control wheel at this point. There's a lot of things that offenders do to control their victims. That's what these cases are about, exercising power over a victim, controlling that victim. And once we understand all those things from the power and control wheel, we'll understand a little better why the victims behave the way they do. And then we can explain it to our judge and jury. So it's important that we educate our allied professionals as well as our judges and jury. This is uh, just a quote from an article. This is why I didn't tell you he was beating me. And it, it, this victim just talks about all the things that were going on. She's in the middle of this horrible thing she describes as a hell uh, and that she blames herself for the hell that that she feels like she created, and she can't see things clearly, that fear and shame overwhelm her, and they're with her constantly, that she looks to family and friends for support, but she just sees that they're going to judge her and be uh, disparaging or der derisive about her decisions in this case. So that's where these victims are often at, and that's the key to understanding what's going on, and it often explains why they've behaved a certain way in a certain case. Uh, it's just a great quote that uh, gives us an insight into what's going on with victims in these cases. So uh, it's important to remember that and understand that. And as you guys mentioned, here's the reality of what victims do. They often stay with an abuser who's been abusive for a long period of time. It goes on and on. They often minimize the abuse and blame themselves for the abuse. It's kind of why the offender engages in the different tactics they engage in to get the victim to minimize what's happened to them and even blame themselves. They fail to report the abuse for a long period of time. They fail to participate in, in the investigation or prosecution of the case. That's some of the most frustrating thing, things that happen in these cases. Prosecutors, law enforcement, we're there to help these folks 
and it's frustrating when they're unable to take advantage of the help we have to offer. But we have to stick with them. We have to understand where they're coming from. It's the key to being successful, ultimately successful in these cases, and it may take a long time. They may request the dismissal of charges. They may recant. Uh, they may testify for the abuser. They may not show up at all. Uh, so we have to understand those things, and we have to be prepared to explain it to a judge or jury. If I have a victim that doesn't appear in court, but I have enough evidence and I've investigated the case in a way that I'm able to go forward, even without my victim present, because I've documented everything, I have uh, some hearsay exceptions to get some non-testimonial hearsay into evidence, or I'm to use the theory of forfeiture by wrongdoing to get the victim's testimonial statements into evidence, I still may have to explain why that victim isn't here. Why should the jury care about what happened to this victim if the victim doesn't care enough to show up at all? And so we may need some expert testimony to explain that. So we want to think about that uh, in these cases. How do we combat these challenges? It's through education. We want to educate those around us who are involved in these cases and then ultimately educate the fact finders in these cases, the judge or jury, so that they know what's going on. All these folks need to be educated. Judges and jurors are what we initially think of, but think back. If we don't understand what's going on, law enforcement, fellow prosecutors, allied professionals, whether it's medical or some other professional that provides services, and the community as well. We want to educate all these folks. Those community members, that piece of the puzzle is really important. It's important to have some sort of outreach program so that members of the community not only understand what's going on, but they know that there are resources out there that they can take advantage of if they end up in a situation where they're the victim of, of this kind of abuse. Those community members might wind up on our jury panel as well. So those efforts pay off in multiple ways, and we want to pay attention and spend time educating everybody on this. And it's an ongoing thing. Dynamics change, new situations arise. We want to review the systems we have in place to make sure that we have the best system possible to respond to this crime, figure out ways we can reach out to folks so that they have the most resources, the best resources available to support them. We want to identify the behavior that we think is going to be an issue at trial. And it might be multiple behaviors, not just one behavior. And then once we identify these behaviors, we want to strategize about the best way to attack or address that behavior at trial. Is an expert going to be necessary in this case? It may not be necessary in every case. You may have a victim that is, is able to explain why they did what they did and perfectly well and, and understand it. You may have a victim that has gotten the support and resources and counseling that they need to become a stronger witness, and they now understand what was going on in this relationship and can explain it themselves. You may have a combination of strategy through jury selection to educate jurors, through argument, and through your victim so that they'll understand what's happened. You may also want to use an expert, though, in many of these cases. Uh, they can be very helpful in explaining the general dynamics of domestic violence and the behaviors that victims engage in as a result of suffering the trauma of domestic violence. And juries tend to really eat up what experts have to say. They, they like to be educated. That's what an expert in this is doing. They're really just educating the jurors about the dynamics of domestic violence, and jurors uh, often like that and uh, will take it to heart. Uh, some of the terms that we're going to use for what the expertise is and what we're talking about would be victim behavior, uh, maybe the effects of battering, victim responses to trauma. And these are all going to be related to domestic violence. You might have experts who are expert in other areas as well, but victim behavior from a domestic violence relationship, the effects of uh, battering in a domestic violence relationship, victim responses to the trauma of domestic violence. Those are the things we are going to talk about, and those are the areas of expertise that we want our folks to talk about in these cases. Some terms that we probably want to avoid using strategically as prosecutors are post-traumatic stress disorder, battered women syndrome or battered person syndrome, rape trauma syndrome, which is related to sexual assault. These are strategically, these are things that exist, but strategically we might want to avoid these because the PTSD, for example, is a diagnosis. And if we're going to talk about that, and that might explain some of our victims' behavior, uh, it may need to be something that is actually diagnosed before we're able to talk about it. And having someone be diagnosed with PTSD may subject them to a defense motion to have them independently diagnosed or examined by a defense expert. Uh, 
Uh, it's also strategically, we don't necessarily want our jury or judge to think that our victim is suffering from something, uh, a disorder or a syndrome that may affect their ability to recall and recount what has happened to them or that there's something wrong with them uh, and they might question their credibility as a result of that. So strategically, we tend to stay away from these areas because they're not typically that helpful to us in a trial, particularly where we have an expert testifying. You can get to all the things that are going on in these uh, disorders, syndromes, without necessarily diagnosing the individual to it by talking about the behavior, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So who is an expert? What, uh, when we're talking about an expert, who are we talking about? So privately chat uh, responses to Emily for this. Uh, who have you called as an expert or who have you thought about, if you haven't called someone as an expert, who have you thought about or considered uh, as an expert in these cases? It, it, again, for this to be a meaningful strategy, we have to be able to identify those that can testify as experts. We have to think about the cost of that expertise and the availability of it. So it's important to think about who those experts are. We have uh, some responses. So we're seeing some domestic violence shelter director or domestic violence advocate, um, a domestic violence clinical professor at a local law school, a social worker, a psychotherapist, um, a police officer maybe. Right, and those are all exactly the right uh, answer. Those are all folks that are probably going to have expertise in this area and are typically maybe available in your community. So they would be great individuals to access and hopefully be able to testify on your behalf or educate you. When I think about using experts, I typically think about trial, trial, trial. Uh, but that's not the only place that an expert in domestic violence, the dynamics and the effects of battering can help us. They can help us in virtually every stage of the case. They can be helpful in investigations. They can identify things that might be helpful to investigators. They can help us in interviewing the victims of domestic violence. Um, uh, uh, an investigator that I've worked with uh, for several years talked about, you know, as, as police officers, we get a lot of training on how to interrogate suspects, but we don't get a lot of training on how to interview victims. And it is, in these cases, domestic violence, sexual violence cases, it's a special skill and it requires a different approach. And victim advocates or experts in domestic violence can really help us in those areas. They can help us in the arrest charging decision and plea negotiation. In pretrial motions, if I'm going to call an expert witness on the dynamics of domestic violence or, the, or victim behavior or the effects of battering, I want to do a pretrial motion on that. I want to do this ahead of time. I want to brief my judge to make sure he understands what we're talking about and has the case law and the authority before him so that he can make an informed decision about whether this should be admissible or not. They'll be helpful at trial as well and potentially at sentencing. I want to have them available at every stage of the case. And it might require using different experts for different things, but they can be helpful in many, many ways, not just to testify at trial. They can help us in all these different ways. Potential experts, as you guys mentioned, victim advocates is the first kind of expert I think of, and every community should have victim advocates available. They may not consider themselves to be experts, uh, but I guarantee you they probably are. Scholars, people who have studied and researched this area, uh, forensic psychiatrist or psychologist who has expertise in this particular area might be a great expert, might be impressive to a jury. A law enforcement officer who is experienced in investigating domestic violence and knows how the victims behave and has seen it again and again and again, they can make a great expert. Uh, law enforcement officers tend not to be subject to criticisms of just believing all victims or being a touchy-feely sort of uh, uh, expert they have that law enforcement credibility, and if they have the experience, they can make a great expert. Same nurses, uh, our sexual assault nurse examiners, can be great experts in these cases if they have that domestic violence background and experience. Uh, they'll make a great expert, as would an ER doctor, uh, if they have that experience. Not all of these experts would have the necessary experience. You've got to identify who does and figure out what the level of their expertise is. Victim advocates are typically going to have that expertise and they're typically available, and they're typically affordable. Uh, so they make a great expert um, in these cases. So think about your victim advocates first. And they can help you identify who's working in this area in your community and who may also be a potential expert in this area. As we're talking about victim advocates, just remember, you don't want to use a victim advocate that is working with your victim as an expert in that case. 
<clears throat> you may not even want to use one that is working at the same facility or same program as uh, your victim may be receiving services at uh, because there's privilege and confidentiality that's involved and we don't want to subject the, the victim advocate to being cross-examined about their interactions with the victim themselves. So remember that you want to use a neighboring expert from another program uh, if it's a victim advocate. Don't use one from your own program. We want to protect our victims and our advocates so that they can continue to do the, do the good work that they do. Where to look, those programs and shelters, hospitals, universities, the law enforcement, our multidisciplinary teams, and national organizations. We get a lot of calls uh, from prosecutors looking for an expert. There's other great national programs that do this, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center in Boston, um, the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence. There's tons of great organizations out there, so reach out to them because they often know some great experts that can help you in these cases. Again, going back to the advocate, the who, me, I'm not an expert. Uh, many advocates would not uh, think of themselves as experts, but they almost definitely are. If they've been doing this for any length of time, they've been working with numbers of clients, dozens or hundreds of victims of domestic violence, and they have experienced and seen those common responses to the trauma of domestic violence that victims engage in, and they'll be able to explain away. Uh, so how we can help them to become better experts is through training and workshops. We'll strip away the mystique. We can do mock testimony. We can prepare them to present solid, helpful testimony to educate the jury. And when they think about themselves as teachers, as folks that are educating the jury on the dynamics of domestic violence or the victim responses, victim behavior as a result of domestic violence, it's not as scary. They really do know this stuff, and they make great experts. So we want to think about our domestic violence advocates as those experts, and they can help us uh, in that way. Some of the, we do training on this as well, if uh, anyone is interested in that. It's usually about a day-long uh, training where we'll work with advocates and prosecutors in a particular jurisdiction, and we'll cover their state law and demonstrate what it takes to get experts in, how to qualify an expert, what a CV should look like. If you're a jurisdiction that wants the expert to prepare a report, we have it, sample reports that uh, you can look at and would tell you exactly what they're talking about in those reports so that the defense is on notice and the court is on notice about what that uh, expert is going to testify about and what they're relying on for that testimony. Uh, they're presenting their qualifications, testimony on direct and cross, that courtroom demeanor that's going to be important, that professional demeanor and working with the defense, how important it is to be available to the defense and the prosecution in these cases, that you're just a down-the-middle-of-the-road expert, independent, not leaning to one side or the other, that you'll work with both sides uh, effectively. And we do this training, it's about a day long, and the first half of the day is usually on the law and what is uh, required to qualify as an expert and what is appropriate testimony, what is, it, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable based on the jurisdiction's case law. And then the second half of the day would be actual mock testimony using uh, some victim offender scenarios to testify from and then having the expert testify on direct and then be cross-examined by someone. So it's an effective way to get advocates who don't consider themselves experts. When I've done this training in the past, I typically open with just saying, uh, raise your hand, please, if you're an expert in domestic violence. And it's a room full of advocates. You know they're experts and not one hand goes up. Uh, so we just got to get folks over the hump. It's uncomfortable to say, yeah, I'm an expert in this, but they are. Uh, and so we can uh, help them with that. Other things that folks can do in this area to help themselves and enhance their professionalism is develop a peer group uh, to talk about expert testimony, to talk about cases, to talk about what victim behaviors were identified and how you might testify and explain those behaviors. Not just explain that these are common behaviors, that I might ask the, the expert witness, uh, are there some common behaviors that the victims of domestic violence engage in as a result of the domestic violence? And they'll say, yes, there are some common behaviors. And I might say, is staying with an abuser a common behavior or is recanting a common behavior? Yes, that's a common behavior or it's not uncommon. And are there some reasons why victims stay with their abuser? And then they would explain some of those reasons. So. Developing a peer group to go over those things can be helpful. Meeting regularly to discuss ongoing cases and any relevant literature or new literature that's out there. Observing folks testify, I think that's so helpful when someone who hasn't testified previously, everybody has to have a first time that they qualify as an expert to testify. But getting to see someone else testify on the same area 
can be very helpful, and then providing critique or asking questions about that testimony of both the witness and the prosecutor who is uh, introducing that testimony. And when you don't, in a lot of areas, this is not common, and folks don't call experts in domestic violence cases all the time. So you don't get that experience to observe testimony on domestic violence dynamics and victim behavior. So just observe any expert that you possibly can who's testifying about anything. Work with your prosecutors to identify them and figure out how do they testify and what do they do that's uh, impactful and successful in their testimony. For our experts, what we recommend is we want to use a general expert or sometimes we call a blind expert. It's someone who hasn't met with the victim. It's someone who's not diagnosing the victim as a victim. There's someone with a limited knowledge of what's going on in this particular case. They may not know anything about this case at all. That may be completely general. And they're only educating the judge or jury on these victim behaviors that they see again and again in these cases. They're victim behaviors that they're going to generally explain. They're going to match up with the victim behaviors in our case. Using a general expert is going to help us avoid a lot of the pitfalls associated with expert testimony. Uh, some of the challenges and objections that the defense might throw up. By using a general expert, we'll avoid many of those, that they're not diagnosing this person, they're not testifying about that this person is believable or credible, they're not testifying that the offender did this or that uh, there was violence or any of those things. So this is a great way to avoid pitfalls, and it's a very effective way to go at these things. This is an independent expert who hasn't met this person, and they're talking about and explaining the things, the very things that we see in this case here. And so it's just another independent source of this information that helps us and helps the jury determine what happened in the case. This is a case out of Vermont from 2008, and it was a strangulation case uh, that the victim testified and was on board on the case. The victim did not recant, but there were a lot of behaviors in the case that the prosecution wanted to explain. And so they introduced uh, an expert talking about battered women syndrome and some of the behaviors associated with that. And the expert was able to explain that, and the court recognized that the evidence was helpful to explain victim behavior that might undermine this witness's credibility if it wasn't explained. And they noted that this was properly confined to general knowledge, and expert properly was precluded from commenting on the parties in this case or the specific facts of this case. So they just explained it generally, exactly the kind of general expert that we think is going to be the most effective and the best way to avoid pitfalls when it comes to expert testimony. So think about that, and this is a great uh, source for that uh, great authority, either persuasive or if you're in Vermont, controlling uh, in these cases. And also when we're talking about our experts, not only do we want a general expert, but we want an expert who gives effective testimony. And the best testimony is plainly worded. We don't want to talk about terms that are above our head or above the average juror's head, unless we explain them thoroughly and plainly. The testimony is simple. It's not complex. It's not going on and on. It is very concise and explaining things in a simple, straightforward fashion. And then it's also peer-reviewed. We want to make sure that peers who are also experts in this area are reviewing what's being said and done so that we know we're on target, we know we're on track, and we know we're being as effective as possible. So let's talk a little bit about the general principles of admissibility. Uh, that's going to be an issue in every case. Uh, the defense is not going to want this testimony to come in, and I think for a couple reasons. The uh, testimony, it's going to be tough for them to have a counter expert in this area because experts that I've seen, they generally agree that these are the actual dynamics of domestic violence. These are the things that victims engage in, the behavior they engage in. And it's pretty well settled. And so it's going to be tough to come up with somebody who says, uh, no, this isn't going to happen. But th there are often experts out there. Uh, but the defense is also not going to want what their main area of contention is, that you can't believe this witness because they stayed with this abuser, because they lied to the police previously, because they did not uh, show up to court, um, that they shouldn't be believed. These are, that Having this expert is going to explain those things away, and they don't want that to happen. So. Admissibility starts with uh, the proper subject of a qualified expert, uh, that that testimony is uh, proper. The first word we think about here is qualified. We have to demonstrate that our expert is qualified. So you're going to, this is something, again, we're going to do ahead of time, prior to trial. Uh, if the more in advance of trial you can do it, the better off. It's going to give your judge the breathing room to make the right decision, to 
consider the brief that you filed that explains why this is proper testimony, why it is necessary, and why it is reliable. Uh, so we want to have that done well ahead of time and lay out the qualifications for our experts. That doesn't mean we don't do it again in front of the jury. I want the jury to hear how great my expert is, how long they've been working with victims, how many victims they've seen, how well they know this area, how much training they've received, if they're published, whatever their expertise might be. The experts aren't going to have all the same uh, qualifications. They just need to be an expert. And the, the burden or the level at which we have to satisfy that they are an expert is not super high. Uh, it, the subject matter has to be beyond the common ken and understanding of the average juror. So it just has to be something that's beyond an average juror's understanding. And victim behavior as a result of domestic violence certainly is something that is beyond the average juror's knowledge. They don't have, if you don't have experience in this area, you don't recognize these behaviors. You don't understand why victims would behave that way, and it causes you to make bad credibility assessments of witnesses when you don't understand these things. Is it reliable? It is certainly reliable. It is certainly well-founded in all the social science research that there are certain behaviors that victims uh, engage in. But not only is that well-founded, the idea that this testimony is necessary because people generally don't understand the dynamics of domestic violence or how victims behave. That is also well-founded in social science research, so that can be established as well in a motion, in a brief, prior to trial. And then the last thing, will this help the trier of fact to understand the evidence or determine a fact and issue? And it certainly will help them to understand the evidence. It might be confusing or hard to understand why a victim would stay with an abuser. And, that, and that's a classic defense tactic to just say, uh, hey, if you were the victim of this level of violence, you'd call the police immediately, wouldn't you? You would have left this individual a long time ago, wouldn't you? And people project their own ideas about how they behave in a situation that they've never been in onto that situation and often agree with the defense attorney. So we want to avoid that. And this is where this testimony comes in. And this is why it's helpful to the trier of fact, because people don't understand these things and these are common things that victims of domestic violence do. They are common behaviors. And once you understand that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are a victim of domestic violence, but you won't get hung up on, hey, I think a victim would have really called the police immediately and uh, make that mistake. So that is how it is helpful in these cases. Uh, this is a case out of New Jersey from 2006, State versus Townsend. And this is such a sad case. It was a murder case where the uh, abuser murdered uh, his victim, and in her dying declaration uh, that was introduced at trial, she denied that he had beaten her. Now, of course, her two sons had witnessed the beating with a two-by-four, uh, and the uh, offender took her to the hospital with the two sons, told them they were very young, told them to say she was hit by a car, and that some men got out and beat her. But she actually denied that he was the one that assaulted her. Uh, and so the state felt like that dying declaration is coming in, even though the victim is not here. We need someone to explain why a victim might deny on their deathbed that this individual uh, had assaulted them. And uh, that's what the testimony was about. And the court recognized those two things. One, that there are a lot of reasons why victims behave the way they do. And it's been documented that there are patterns of uh, physical and psychological abuse. Uh, there are things that affect victims when they are subject to this pattern of physical and psychological abuse. And they also recognize that people don't understand that. Lay observers don't understand why victims behave the way they do. And so that this testimony was absolutely proper. Uh, so that's a strong case that covers both those bases. Uh, most states fall into one of two types of jurisdictions, a fry state or a Daubert state. The feds are, are under the Daubert theory. Uh, and that's basically the Fry case, case says that expert testimony must be generally accepted in the relevant scientific community for it to be admissible. Whereas the Daubert case said that um, there are several standards that uh, the judge must uh, find for expert testimony to be admitted. And the Fry standard is one of them. It's the uh, final standard. The Kumho Tire case uh, kind of extended the Daubert case from not just scientific knowledge, but to technical and other specialized knowledge, which Rule 702, the rule we previously discussed, governing admissibility of expert testimony uh, includes uh, not just new scientific knowledge, but also technical or other specialized knowledge. 
And we're really talking about other specialized knowledge when we're talking about expert testimony in victim behavior as a result of domestic violence. The criteria under Daubert is, has this theory been tested? Can it be tested? Can those results be reproduced? And for scientific uh, evidence, that's appropriate. It, it, that is something that uh, can be reproduced. Think about DNA or think about, uh, I always think about the radar guns when those first came into use. Were those testable? Were they peer reviewed, subjected to peer review and published the results in DNA and those other scientific things? Of course that happens. Uh, and in domestic violence, uh, social science, that is uh, subjected to peer review and published as well. Is there a known or potential rate of error for those hard sciences? Yes, there is. For the sciences, the social sciences we're talking about, there's not going to be an error rate. Standards controlling the technique's operation, it's not exactly applicable to us. And is it generally accepted in the relevant scientific community? Well, that is true in domestic violence expertise. Uh, but all these Dauber factors don't always apply in the kind of expertise that we're talking about. And so while the court has a gatekeeping function under Daubert, this list that is traditionally used, that is traditionally uh, put up when we're introducing scientific evidence, is not an exhaustive list. And all they may not all apply. All these standards may not apply as they might in a science, a hard science. So we don't want to get caught up thinking that, oh, well, because there's no error rate here, uh, this is going to be inadmissible. It should still be admissible, and there's a good reason why. This case, the U.S. v. Simmons case from 2006, uh, this was a, a rape case where the uh, offenders were police officers, and the victim uh, initially reported the assault but then uh, wanted to not go forward, wanted to um, uh, drop out of the, the case, and they wanted to talk about some of the dynamics in sexual violence in this case. And this is a, the, the Simmons case that basically said you don't have to satisfy every Daubert factor uh, to show that the testimony is reliable, that the court has that gatekeeping function about what testimony should come in and what testimony shouldn't come in, and that's a flexible function, that they can bring many of these things in uh, one way or the other. Uh, the court held the expert testimony admissible in this case, even though many of those Daubert factors were not satisfied. They found that the expert was reliable, was qualified, the testimony was reliable, and it was going to assist the trier of fact in determining the evidence, understanding the evidence, and determining facts and issue. So uh, in the Simmons case, all of that came in. Uh, and they talked about that hard science versus what they call the soft science, uh, that some of these sciences do not have the exactness of hard science methodology. Uh, and the judge is given broad discretion to determine whether those factors are going to be applicable or not, and whether they're going to be an, a reasonable measure of reliability in a particular case. So it was important in that case to recognize that while Daubert does control, not all of those factors have to be there in every case, and they don't uh, apply necessarily to every kind of expertise. State versus Borelli is a case out of uh, Connecticut. That's an older case. And that case talked about how the Fry standards don't necessarily apply to this type of testimony. And what they really focused on here, it's, a, it's an interesting case that was a domestic violence case, but they talked about how experts in this type of case are maybe different from experts, say, in a DNA case. Uh, a DNA expert, that science is so overwhelming and so over our heads that jurors are just kind of in a position where they basically have to rely on what that expert tells them because they don't have the inherent knowledge and expertise to challenge what a DNA expert might say on the stand. So that gatekeeping function of the judge is critical there to make sure that that expert is absolutely qualified and what they're talking about is reliable because jurors won't be able to challenge it. But in this kind of testimony, jurors can uh, reasonably assess how relevant this testimony is. This isn't so far over their heads that they can't understand and uh, assess whether it's helpful or not and regard or disregard it however they want. So it was a, a, very, a little bit of a different case in, in, for this expertise. This is another case, Ortiz, uh, State versus Ortiz out of Washington, uh, where the expert was a Border Patrol in tracking, and this was a murder case, and he, his testimony was critical in identifying the assailant in this case. And uh, the, the court basically said, again, that his expertise was not based on a novel scientific uh, experimental procedure, but on his own practical experience and acquired knowledge 
and it was not so technical that the jury could not judge its, the reliability for itself, and it was admissible, and that was upheld, and so uh, that resulted in a conviction. So that's a little bit of an unusual one, but another example of how expertise may not fit exactly into the Brian Daubert test, uh, but should still be admissible because it is reliable uh, and it is helpful to the judge or jury, and we do have a qualified expert. This uh, last case, State versus Gressinger, was an attempted murder case out of Minnesota. And again, it was basically they introduced the battered uh, women's syndrome evidence uh, through this expert testimony in their case in chief against the alleged batterer. And it helped the jury understand uh, the victim's behavior that would have otherwise undermined her credibility. Uh, and the expert did not testify on the ultimate fact of whether the alleged victim actually suffered from the syndrome or not. Uh, and so that was okay. They also talked about whether this would be admissible in the case in chief or whether it was had to be held uh, in rebuttal. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, typically to get this expert testimony in to explain victim behavior so the victim's testimony won't be undermined, the victim's credibility won't be undermined, sometimes the state might require that the victim's credibility be attacked first. And so we may have to strategize about how we're going to get this uh, evidence in. You can make strong arguments that the case is going to hinge on the victim's credibility and the defense is going to attack the victim's credibility based on her behavior, and therefore it should be allowed to come in in the case in chief. Uh, also, as a time-saving uh, effort, uh, courts may be willing to go with that theory. But you may have to wait and do it in rebuttal. And so it's just up to the court when and where that testimony is going to come in. A lot of cases, a lot of states have case law on this area of uh, expert testimony in domestic violence cases, but not every state does, and they may not have uh, cases on point. Um, so we got to look to other areas to see that this testimony can come in. And there are other cases that involve victim behavior. Typically, what I find when I'm researching various states' case law is that a lot of states will have case law on child sexual abuse expert testimony, and that some of that has been allowed to come in. And the principles are going to be the same. It's explaining this victim behavior so that the jury can adequately and accurately assess a witness's credibility without being sidetracked by behaviors that are counterintuitive but are actually very common in these cases. And so that might be the area. There may have been expert testimony admitted in a, to explain victim behavior in a sexual assault case. So we don't want to just rely on domestic violence case law we want to look for any case law that can help us. There's a lot of federal cases that accept this type of uh, expert testimony and other states that accept it that can be persuasive and illustrative. And also think about cases where the defense has been allowed to introduce battered women's syndrome as a defense in a case of either assault or often homicide. Uh, if it's good for the defense, it should be good for the prosecution as well. So that might be the case you're looking for and that you need to rely on to demonstrate that this should be admissible and has been admissible in the past. Okay, do we have a couple questions? Um, do you see any new issues for experts talking about victim behaviors with the increase in law enforcement body cameras showing unusual behavior by a victim at the scene? So uh, are body cameras going to uh, impact these cases because now you're going to have video recording of uh, maybe victim behaviors at the scene that will need to be explained? I think that's going to maybe increase the necessity of having these uh, experts to explain this. It's just going to, you know, these victim behaviors are always at issue in the case. And whether it's captured on video or whether it's simply going to be testimony that the defense elicits through the officer to say, well, isn't it true? I mean, think of your classic domestic violence scene where the police show up and the abuser often is very compliant, very cooperative, very uh, interactive with the officers in, in what they might consider an appropriate way. And uh, a victim of domestic violence is very upset, very uh, hysterical, maybe even a little combative with the officers. And uh, so those sorts of things might need to be explained. Uh, and often a victim can explain it, often, often an experienced officer can explain it, but we don't want the defense to elicit this testimony, particularly through the officer, that the victim did X, Y, or Z that is uh, inexplicable. So it, it may result in us needing to use this more and more. It's certainly something that's going to have to be addressed because it's one thing for an officer to testify about what happened, but when you see it on video, sometimes those are things that a jury may not understand and we really need to address. And another question that came up, um, somebody's trying to balance between bringing in a lot of prior abuses but then needing an expert to explain why the victim went back versus limiting the prior abuse history and focusing on the brutal crime. 
Yeah, so that's a good strategic uh, call, and it's probably a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, that those prior crimes and other acts evidence are going to be critical in these cases, and so I do think it's important to bring in those prior episodes. And you may not, you may have to explain, okay, why did she give him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to abuse her and to victimize her that way? And and people find that hard to understand, and so we we'll need someone to explain it. And maybe it's your victim, but maybe you need that expert testimony. Testimony. I really do think the key to these cases, though is painting that big picture about the relationship, not about what happened on the four corners of this evening or this day or this one assault. I don't think people can understand domestic violence and how it works and why it's happening if they don't have the full context of the relationship to understand it. And that's why our investigations have to be thorough, and they have to ask about the history of the relationship. Otherwise, I'm not going to have as much success as I potentially can have if I can only explain this push, this shove, this slap, this hit on this one night. If they don't know, hey, this has been happening and it's been escalating and it's been going on for some time, they can't appreciate what's going on now. Not just why this is happening now or how this happened, but that it's getting worse and worse. And that this offense is actually a very serious offense. When you have a lot of violence in an assault, then it's obvious that it's a serious offense. But I do think those prior acts are critical for a jury to understand what's going on. So I would want to bring in my prior crimes and other acts evidence and then have someone explain why. I think you make a great point. Why does this victim keep going back uh, to that individual? And we can explain that. So a, a great uh, practical strategy in these cases. Good questions. Okay. Uh, so we want to have some trial strategy in these cases. That's a good example of, of when you may want to have an expert or when you may you have so much good evidence in this case, I'm not going to muddy the waters with the, the prior relationship history, uh, and uh, uh, I'm just going to go forward with my straight case. So that's a uh, strategy. If we do feel like we want to call an expert, we do want to have some strategies about how we're going to do that too. And again, we're not just going to rely on an expert to testify about these victim behaviors and explain it. We want to explain it every opportunity we get. And let's start with jury selection, voir dire. Can we use the experiences of the jury panel to explain to one another why these things happen, to explain through their own experiences that, oh, yeah, uh, I did. I had a, a cousin who was a victim of domestic violence, and she stayed with that guy forever, and we never knew what was going on. She hid, hid and covered up and lied about it. And those are going to match up with your uh, case, the behaviors of your victim in your case. And then you can do it in opening argument and in your direct testimony with the victim and then follow it up with a, an expert. And so you're hitting the jury multiple times with this testimony, with this idea, with this evidence, so that it doesn't come as a shock or it's not difficult for them to understand when it does happen. But strategically, we want to avoid danger zones. So we cannot have our expert testify about a particular witness's credibility. They're not there to be a human lie detector test. They cannot say that this person is clearly uh, telling the truth. And they can't testify as to whether an assault did or did not happen. So we, don't, we want to avoid the mistake of, saying that it's very common for victims to stay with their abuser. It's very common for victims to fail to cooperate with the police or prosecutors. It's very common for victims to recant and testify on behalf of their defendant. And that because this victim did all those things, this victim must really be a victim of domestic violence. That's not the purpose of this testimony. It's simply to explain that these things happen very often, and you should not make a false credibility assessment just because a victim behaved in a way that you don't understand because you've never been in this situation judge or jury. So we want to avoid those danger zones. You cannot testify if a victim is telling the truth. The defense can't. The prosecution can't. You can't comment on the credibility of, of that witness through another witness, through an expert witness. You can't testify whether the violence happened or not. And you can't testify to the guilt or innocence of the accused. So these are things that we want to avoid. This is where that general expert, that blind expert, is going to really come in helpful. And it's going to avoid these pitfalls because they've never met this victim. They're not diagnosing this victim, and they may not know much, if anything, about the case. Sometimes you might want to give them information about the case and tell them about what's happened because they'll be able to help you identify the areas, the behaviors that are going to hang a jury up, the things that need to be explained. So you might give them some of that information. Uh, but if you've been doing this for a while and you know the issues, then you might just use them as a blind expert. But that's going to help us avoid some of these problems, and those are some of the pitfalls. All right, so another question. As we're going through this, 
what are some common objections you might anticipate to introducing this type of expert testimony? What are some of the things that we're afraid the defense is going to throw up in our face as we're going forward? Again, they're not going to want this testimony to come in, and uh, so they're going to try and stop it from coming in because they don't want this to be explained in a way that uh, is going to make a jury uh, understand why victims behave the way they do and help a jury understand why the offender was doing what he did. Uh, so what do we think might be some common objections in these cases? Some are saying prior bad acts might not be admissible, years of experience, uh, too prejudicial. Uh, they argue that any testimony about victim behavior is really just an attempt at vouching. Yeah. Okay. So those are those are great answers um, for some of the objections that we'll get that we will get in that. Uh, the, the too prejudicial is a good one, which I haven't covered in uh, my responses. Um, but remember, even relevant evidence can be excluded if its probative value is outweighed by its unfair prejudice or its potentially unfair prejudice. So that's a great objection that the defense can throw up. And um, so by using that general expert, we can really inoculate our case and our witness against that uh, by saying that, no, it's not going to be overly prejudicial. They're just explaining generally how this works. They're not commenting on this case specifically at all. And so it's while the testimony is going to explain victim behavior, it doesn't comment on the defendant or the defense at all. And uh, uh, so it, it's not unfairly prejudicial to him. Um, but is it relevant? It's, of course, got to be relevant, and it will be relevant in almost all of your cases because the jury is going to get hung up on these issues if they're not explained. But when does that expert testimony become relevant? Does there have to be an attack first? So check your state law. If you guys want help on this, we're available to check state law for you as well. We can tell you whether you're a Daubert or Fry state, whether there has to be that prior attack, what the case law is currently in your state. And uh, at what point in trial does that attack commonly occur? In some cases, it happens in the defense's opening remarks. They're going to tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't believe this victim, and it's right in the opening statement. So uh, th in that case, I think your case in chief should be able to include that uh, expert testimony if they've already opened the door to that or in their jury selection questions. Uh, but maybe it's not going to come until cross-examination, uh, and then you can follow up in your case in chief uh, on that testimony. Uh, as well, uh, but it might not come until the defense start, opens their case, and so it may be rebuttal later on in the case. So think about all those things. Some of the other common objections are going to be, as somebody said, vouching for the witness or improper bolstering, as it sometimes is referred to, uh, that you're really just basically introducing this testimony to say that uh, you should believe my, my victims, uh, you should believe uh, what happened. And so our response to that is that the, the standard uh, for the admission of this testimony is, is it relevant and helpful in understanding the issue? And victim credibility is the main issue. And the victim behavior alone uh, may undermine that credibility, or the victim's credibility may be overtly attacked by the defense, and this is necessary to combat that and to help the jury understand what's going on in this case. So we we might get that vouching. And, again, you're, you're not going to vouch directly for this witness. You're not going to have your expert testify that your victim is believable or credible. They're not going to comment on them at all, and that's how you avoid uh, that issue. Does it improperly invade the province of the jury? Uh, and the testimony does not improperly invade the province of the jury. It's offered to educate the jury about how victims behave after experiencing this trauma, uh, and it will not include any opinion as to the victim's credibility or the defendant's skills. So it does not improperly invade that province of the jury. Uh, credibility is the exclusive, determining credibility is the exclusive province of the jury, uh, and we're not invading that either because our expert witness is not commenting on that victim's credibility. They're just educating the jury on issues that could affect credibility. Improperly comments on truthfulness is another one. Well, the fact that it is relevant to credibility and it might touch on credibility doesn't make it inadmissible. Uh, it is offered for a proper purpose that will assist and aid the jury in determining these facts and understanding the evidence. And that the fact that it happens to impact credibility does not bar its admission. Uh, again, our expert witness is not commenting directly on this witness's credibility. They're not commenting directly on anything that happened in this case. That general expert is going to really inoculate you against these attacks. Uh, no foundation. Uh, so make sure that we've just laid that proper foundation. One is going to be that our witness is actually an expert witness, that they have the knowledge, skill, education, and experience 
to make uh, to give this opinion. They know what they're talking about. That comes under Rule 104. That's a preliminary question. The judge has to determine that an expert is an expert before they'll allow their opinion testimony. Uh, also, that the subject matter is beyond the ken of the average juror, beyond their understanding. So let's lay that out in a brief ahead of time, and we can lay out all the uh, social science research that indicates that people don't understand this, and they make bad credibility judgments because they don't understand victim behavior as a result of domestic violence. Uh, does the testimony aid the jury in understanding the evidence? Of course it will, because juries, we know from the social science research, they don't understand this testimony, and this will help them if they understand that these are common reactions, common behaviors as a result of domestic testimony, domestic violence, rather, uh, that uh, the jury will understand it. And is the testimony reliable? It is. Uh, the social science research establishes this convincingly that these are common behaviors in these cases. So that brief is important. We can help you with uh, preparing that brief as well. Um, somebody was mentioning uh, the imperative to introduce trauma factors involving the victim and survivor to the jury, which could help explain the irrational, quote-unquote, irrational or emotional response. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a, a good point. And uh, trauma is involved in these things. And they, we have the neurobiology of trauma that uh, explains a lot of the reasons why victims behave they, the way they do. You just have to make sure you have an expert who is qualified to talk about trauma um, through their education experience, um, expertise, background, profession. So just make sure you have the right expert when you're getting into trauma. That can be tricky, and that can involve medical, psych, psychiatric testimony. Uh, so I just want to make sure that we use the right expert in those cases. But that trauma is important and certainly impacts all these cases. Um, so in going forward, what do we want to think about? We want to be able to identify and develop potential experts, particularly experts in our locality. Uh, expertise, expert testimony can be expensive, and if you don't have a budget to pay for this, then you've got experts in your locality. Let's try and identify them and work with them and develop them so that they can become good expert witnesses and assist us in our, our casework. Uh, work with experts at all stages of the case from investigation through sentencing. What is an appropriate sentence in these cases? Just the fact that somebody's arrested doesn't mean these dynamics, the power and control dynamics are gonna stop. What do we do to arrest this behavior? Experts can really help us with that. Uh, we wanna be able to articulate the proper legal foundation for the introduction of expert testimony in these cases. So that case law, that research, uh, the operative legal theories that allow this to come in, we can help you with all that stuff. And we wanna be prepared to overcome the common defense objections. Uh, we know what a handful of them are gonna be, and let's be ready to go and meet those objections as they arise. Because this is legitimate testimony, it has been found to be so in many, many jurisdictions, both federal and state, and it can be extremely helpful in these cases to assist the trier of fact in understanding that evidence. So this is a, a strategy that will really help us move these cases forward, and it's one that I really encourage folks to explore. If you need any help with any of this, please contact us, and uh, we'll do everything we can to identify experts and help you prepare motions and briefs that will adequately address the issues that might be raised as a result of this testimony coming in. Thanks, guys. Thanks for uh, listening this afternoon. Yes, on, I, thank you, John, for uh, your presentation, and thank all of you for attending and your participation and your questions. If we didn't get to any of your questions, we can follow up afterwards. But thank you for your dedication in increasing victim safety and offender accountability in your communities and across the country. Uh, remember that Equitas is a 24-7 technical assistance provider. We're available to respond to your questions, concerns, training needs as they relate to prosecution and violence against women. So thank you on behalf of Equitas. Thanks for participating and have a good afternoon.